Hello, I'm Brandon Bennett, and I'm the Code Compliance Director for the City of Fort Worth. This is a real brief update on the West Nile virus. The purpose of this presentation is to give you a real brief summary of what the virus is and how it's transmitted, to go over the data from 2012, to look at how the city responded back in 2012, and then even more important, to look at what our plan is for 2013. First of all, let's look at the life cycle of the mosquito. Mosquitoes are actually born from eggs that are placed in water. And the source of the water um, is very critical to how mosquitoes breed and reproduce. In this case, um, they need stagnant water, uh, which is water that has been sitting around uh, anywhere between three and seven days. Uh, good source pools would be, say, um, after it rains and there is water that pools in a bucket or in a tire, um, in something as small as a uh, soda bottle cap that, that is um, sitting upward to collect the rainwater, or an old can that collects water in it. Uh, what a good source um, is is also one that um, has, uh, oh, like grass clippings in it or is around grass, kind of marshy areas, um, because the, the mosquitoes will eventually need um, some nutrients in, in that water in order to develop into a mosquito. Swimming pools, rivers, uh, lakes beyond um, more than one feet deep, uh, none of those are good source pools for, for mosquitoes. In fact, um, there's nothing better than, than a good gully washer rainstorm uh, in the middle of the summer uh, to wash out all the stagnant water uh, for us in, in fighting uh, mosquitoes because uh, it also washes out the eggs and, and then we have to wait for that water to get stagnant again uh, for the mosquitoes to lay eggs. So the, after the eggs are laid uh, in the water, they will um, go through a 10 to 14 day cycle. Uh, they'll turn into larvae. Um, and these kind of look like, uh, might be mistaken at times, um, as maybe tadpoles or uh, little fish. Uh, and then what happens is after about two weeks, um, the mosquito will uh, develop. It will come out of a hard shell. Uh, it'll initially um, walk across the top of the water. Uh, it'll dry itself in the sun uh, and then take to flight. After taking to flight, it'll typically roost uh, up in a tree, at least the, the Culex uh, type mosquito will. And, and this is the, the type of mosquito which uh, is most dangerous to human beings for um, giving us the West Nile virus. Um, these are not the ankle biter type mosquitoes that um, someone might see or someone might get bit by in the middle of the day. Um, those are a different breed of mosquito that, that typically live down low in foliage or, or down in the wet grass. Uh, the Culex mosquito likes to live up uh, in the 8 to, to, to 10 feet uh, above ground area, uh, which is critical when you're looking at um, how we attack the virus and, and uh, keep it from uh, infecting uh, too many humans. So having this in mind, um, the mosquito, the first three to five days, um, it doesn't have the ability. Um, its mouth uh, is still relatively spongy and it can't break through uh, either the skin of a bird or a human. So it'll live off of uh, nectar, honeydew uh, for, for a bit. Uh, but once their, their mouth hardens and it can take what, what's called a blood meal, um, then it will, in this case, the Culex, uh, will seek out primarily birds. Uh, remember, the, the Culex mosquito likes to live uh, high in the tree. Uh, that's where birds are also roosting. So it's an easy blood meal for them. And, and a blood meal is important for a mosquito because um, the only mosquitoes that, that, that bite um, either mammals or um, uh, reptiles or, or others are the female and they have to have a blood meal before they can produce eggs uh, to create more mosquitoes. Uh, the males, um, uh, they, they only live for a few days um, after they, they move to the adult stage uh, and they only live off of, of nectar and then they die off. So one of the reasons why we we talk about the number of days and, and, and the different stages is that um, by the time midsummer rolls around and we start seeing a lot of 
uh, human victims of the West Nile virus, uh, we have to understand that 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 report isn't because of something that just occurred. It is something that occurred four to six weeks previous to the actual identification of the virus in the human. And so in this case, uh, what I like about this, this slide is, is it really calls into play the, the difficulty um, in, in looking at this from a predictability or, or attack plan uh, for the city and, and other agencies. Um, you know, water first has to sit for, you know, four to seven days. Uh, mosquito will, will lay eggs in that dirty water. Uh, it can be 10 to 14 days for the eggs to develop into an adult. The adult needs about four days before it can, it can uh, take its first blood meal. Um, it will um, bite birds. Not all birds carry the West Nile virus, but if it is um, unfortunate enough to bite a bird that carries the West Nile virus, um, then it will take um, anywhere from 10 to 14 days for that virus to uh, develop in the mosquito and give it the ability to either transfer that virus to, to other birds or to human beings. Uh, and then after uh, an infected mosquito bites a human being, um, it will be 10 to 14 days before that human being becomes symptomatic, where they start feeling uh, maybe a little sick. Um, and they will go to the doctor and, and the doctor will test for West Nile virus and getting that test could, could take anywhere from four to seven days to get the results. And so this is why we really press for um, early treatment of source pools uh, early in the summer because we won't know um, how big of a problem that we're going to have until four to six weeks after um, these little critters start getting up in the air. This slide uh, in, in particular calls out uh, what we see typically uh, in any season and then um, calls out what we saw specifically uh, in 2012 and that is that there is uh, the majority of cases happen in or reported cases for human West Nile virus occur in late July uh, into late August. And so remember, if, if all of this starts six weeks prior to that, that means that we need to really be addressing, you know, mosquitoes and source pools and um, really combating the, the, this problem somewhere in late May to, to early June. So this slide uh, represents uh, what is the traditional response of government agencies based on uh, lessons learned from previous years. Uh, that you know, we start with a lot of um, education in in May, uh, telling people, hey, uh, we need you to drain your source pools. You know, turn your buckets upside down. Don't let your your bird bath water uh, become stagnant. Make sure that you you swap out the the water bowls or the water in the water bowls for your pets. Um, wool burrows, make sure they're turned upside down. You know, anything that can hold water uh, is a potential uh, breeding. Uh, ground for mosquitoes. So, you know, by addressing the mosquitoes on the front side, they're on the breeding, uh, we reduce the number of mosquitoes that are in the air that could potentially uh, take a blood mill from an infected bird and then transfer that virus to uh, a human being. And then when we move into the June time frame, um, that's when we really start pushing the general education, uh, really pushing um, what are called the four Ds. Um, you know, the Culex mosquitoes, the ones that primarily carry this virus, are most as active at dusk into the nighttime areas and then uh, somewhat active at dawn. And so, you know, we want people to stay indoors as much as possible during those time periods. Uh, if they have to be outside during those time periods, then, you know, we want people to dress appropriately, try to wear pants, try to wear long sleeve shirts, you know, try to wear, you know, things that provide you some type of defense against mosquito bites. And then we also promote um, as part of the D's is, is DEET, uh, and that's a repellent. And there's lots of repellents on the market. You don't have to go with, uh, with DEET, which is a chemical. Uh, there's Avon, Skin So Soft, and uh, a lot of other natural products out there uh, that work just as good. In fact, uh, I would uh, encourage you to go to the city's website uh, for West Nile virus information, uh, and there's a whole list of, of natural and chemical repellents and, and how long those repellents 
insurance uh, will give you um, some level of protection. And they're rated much like sunscreen is rated. You know, the higher the number, uh, the more protection that, that, that you would receive. Uh, as we move into, um, you know, later June, then into July, um, we start looking at uh, some targeted outreach and education. And, and that's because it's at this time period that doctors will start seeing uh, human beings that are showing the symptoms of West Nile virus, that uh, they'll be tested for it. There's a positive finding that's reported to the health department, and then the health department noti notifies the city. Um, we will go into these na these neighborhoods. We'll do door-to-door -door, uh, education. We'll do reverse 911 education. Uh, we will uh, encourage neighborhood associations and others to hold uh, town hall type meetings to, 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 to get the, the information out. Uh, and then we'll also do an environmental assessment around um, all human cases that we will look for source pools. Um, you know, is there um, a source of, of water out there that, that is uh, a breeding source for, for the mosquitoes? Because uh, we do know that if we can reduce the number of adult mosquitoes, then we can also reduce the risk of transmission of the disease from, from bird to mosquito and then mosquito to, to human. And this includes um, also we will do flyovers uh, in these areas where we will look for like green pools, like abandoned swimming pools. Um, if it's a, a swimming pool that, that is chlorinated and that is used, that's not a good um, source pool for mosquitoes. Uh, the Trinity River, because it's flowing water, is not a good source pool. Lakes that are deeper than one foot are not good source pools. I mean, you're really talking about, you know, puddle-type environments, uh, wool burrows, buckets, um, things like that. Uh, we also really push uh, real hard uh, early summer uh, a program called 5x5, Five Five, and that is, you know, most people that get bit by these Culex mosquitoes because they're very weak flyers, uh, these Culex mosquitoes were, you know, they laid eggs, and then they hatched as a mosquito on the person's property or within five properties on either side of the person that, that was infected. And so the five by five is check your property and then go and talk with five neighbors on each side of you and make sure they're checking their property. Um, that's one of the best things you can do to protect yourself and, and protect your community. When we start getting into late July and early August, um, we do a lot more mosquito uh, surveillance and samples. Um, if we start seeing multiple victims at that point, um, we will hold uh, far more public meetings. Uh, and those meetings are not only to raise awareness to um, the risk, but it's also uh, to raise the awareness that we may have to do some targeted spraying. Uh, when there's mosquitoes that are up in the air and they are um, transferring the West Nile virus to human beings, uh, one of the most effective ways of, of reducing that risk is for the city to, to go and spray public areas um, in the evening. And, and we would typically do that after 10 o'clock at night and before 3 in the morning. And what we do is we make sure that, that the neighborhoods uh, know uh, when we're going to be there, how we're going to be there, and the type of chemicals that we may be using. Uh, we typically will hit the same uh, targeted area, which is, which is usually about um, a mile to a mile and a half um, from a center point, and that center point being an area where we've had multiple folks that have been uh, infected with the virus. And uh, what we use, uh, the chemical that we use, is about 3,500 times less potent um, than, than the, the typical uh, insecticides that you could buy from, from your neighborhood hardware store. And so it's important that we let people know um, about the health risks um, that, that are very minimal, uh, to let them know when we're going to do it, how we're going to do it. Um, and, and one of the benefits is here in Fort Worth that the particular chemical that we use is that um, it will, it's more of a vapor than a spray. It'll stay up in the air for about 15, 20 minutes, and, and then it'll settle to the ground. Uh, and when the sun comes up in the morning, those rays from the sun actually inactivate it. And so it, at that point, it, it is not a threat to, to honeybees or butterflies or ladybugs um, or any of the daytime insects that are very beneficial to the environment. Um, and we continue the, these activities through September um, until the threat uh, decreases. When you look at some of the data, um, you know, going back uh, to 2007 into last year, as you can see, uh, you know, 
there weren't a whole lot of West Nile cases. And um, there's two types of um, symptomatic type things that we look for uh, on the virus. Uh, the blue line uh, represents West Nile fever. And uh, the vast majority of, of people that are infected with, with West Nile virus, they'll either not even know they were infected by it, that they're, they're what's called asymptomatic, that there's no symptoms whatsoever, or they're developed flu-like symptoms, which is the, the blue line there. In less than 1% of, of all the cases, we'll get what's called uh, neuroevasive uh, form of, of West Nile virus. And, and this can lead to encephalitis, uh, meningitis, uh, some of the more uh, serious diseases. This is what is, is most concerning uh, and the highest risk um, of the disease itself. What we don't know is for 2013 is whether or not these numbers will remain high, uh, go higher, or drop off. Th this for the entire nation and for all the scientists that are working on it, um, there's just no predictable model for West Nile virus th that, that exists to tell us whether th this trend will continue or not. So um, we're doing a lot of surveillance uh, for 2013 and um, doing a lot more planning for 2013 just in case the, the numbers go higher. When you look at human case comparison uh, among the, the Metroplex, uh, Fort Worth had uh, you know, some of the lowest numbers uh, so far as, as those that were uh, infected with the virus and in particular um, those that were uh, infected with the, the, the more severe form of it. Uh, when you look at, at Dallas, that got a lot of coverage in the news, about 7.7 .7 cases per 100,000 in, in Fort Worth, uh, down around 4.2. When, when you look at West Nile virus, it, you know, the strategy towards um, addressing the virus itself and, and whether we spray or we don't spray and where we educate and how we educate and how we do surveillance, um, it, it, it's somewhat complicated um, and, and very much integrated with um, data that we can draw from multiple sources. So this particular map, um, we felt it would be easier to, to call out where our hot zones were um, last year using zip codes. And, and what I want you to know is that we did not spray the entire zip code where you see red and orange, which represents the, the highest number of cases. We did, in each, in each one of the orange zones, um, we did spray about um, an area um, oh, uh, of about uh, one square mile. Uh, and up in the red zone, uh, we had another uh, area about one square mile, which, which are really relatively small areas within that, that entire zip code. And uh, what we found was that when we trapped mosquitoes and tested them for West Nile virus, there were a lot of positive West Nile virus mosquitoes in our traps. When we went back and tested after we sprayed, we saw fewer mosquitoes and we found no positive mosquitoes in the trap. So we know um, that the spraying was effective. Uh, we don't nuisance spray um, uh, like some cities do, and that is where you, you spray throughout the year. Uh, we just spray targeted areas where uh, there have been uh, mosquitoes trapped that are carrying the virus and where we've had human cases of the virus uh, reported. What, what's kind of interesting about this map, however, is, you know, when you look at, um, you know, the, the question of, you know, some cities aerial sprayed and some cities didn't aerial spray, um, when you look at the, the right side of the map there, and that would be the east side of Fort Worth, you can see that's where we had the majority of our, our cases. Um, when you get about to the center of the map, moving over to the left, you can see that, that maybe there was one victim or no victims whatsoever. And um, if you look at the insert map there of the state of Texas, what, what's kind of interesting is, is that the number of cases seems to follow uh, the average rainfall uh, map from the Weather Service, and that is the areas of the Metroplex um, that get higher amounts of rain tended to have higher numbers of West Nile virus victims. You can't really make a true um, relationship to this because you, you know, that alone is, is fairly simple. You'd have to look at the demographics and the, 
and the population density and, and that. But we wanted to call this out because, you know, one of, one of the biggest uh, problems that we have fighting the West Nile virus is, is reducing the number of mosquitoes that are in the environment in the first place. And, and because they need water as a, a breeding source, um, you can't turn a blind eye to the fact that the wetter areas, at least by rainfall of the city, uh, at least this last year in tracking, had a higher incidence of um, West Nile virus. So we want to make sure we drive that home to folks. You have to make sure your wheelbarrows uh, are not collecting water, buckets, you know, anything that can hold stagnant water needs to be drained and drained uh, throughout the summer. Uh, we uh, had a lot of partnerships this last year. We didn't act in isolation. Um, we had a number of uh, conversations and meetings with the CDC, the EPA. Uh, we worked with ASPCA. Um, you know, there were rumors out there that the spray that we were going to use was harmful to cats. And um, what we found was what we were actually using um, would have to be a thousand times more concentrated to even cause a rash on a cat. Um, and much more uh, higher in order to, to actually uh, impact its, its general health. Uh, you know, we, we benefit by having UNT Health Sciences right here in Fort Worth. Um, they were a great partner, and in fact, uh, this, this upcoming season, uh, we have partnered with um, them to where they will be helping us with surveillance and testing and, and helping collect data uh, to see if we can come up with a more predictable model um, for the future. Um, the city had an all-hands response. Um, we had the parks, the streets, um, police and fire getting the word out. It, it, was, it was a really good response. And then we also worked with, you know, Fort Worth ISD and, and for that matter, all the ISDs well, with the hospital and the hospital community, the business community. You know, education is, is a real big piece to, to addressing this virus. But at the end of the year, when you look at uh, the virus as a whole, looking, this, looking at this from a, a, a national perspective, um, the health community uh, came up with a consensus, which was that cities need to either re-implement or implement comprehensive and consistent mosquito surveillance. This is where mosquitoes are trapped throughout the season um, to see if they are carrying the virus, and then if they are, even before there are uh, human cases, to start taking efforts to redu reduce the source pool and reduce the number of adult mosquitoes that, that are up in the air. Um, also, source pool elimination activities and larviciding, and th this requires a lot of community engagement. This is the, you know, the five by five, getting getting not only you but getting your neighbors involved in, in draining the, the the source pools, and then emphasis of, of personal protection. If you look at at Fort Worth um, and Tarrant County, that seventy percent of the people that contracted West Nile virus this last year, actually it was over seventy percent, didn't use any type of of um, repellent, none whatsoever. And the vast majority of those were aware of the virus. They were aware that they needed to be using repellent just because of the lack of convenience to it or accessibility to it. Um, they forgot, you know, no matter the reason, um, over 70% said they were not using repellent at the time that they would have been uh, bit by a mosquito and contracted the virus. We have to work on that really, really hard. And when I say we, what I mean is you, me, uh, and everybody else in the community, because this is where personal responsibility really plays a, a big role. And then uh, lastly, adult deciding spraying. You know, I can tell you from the, the public meetings that we had uh, this last year that we had about a third of the people that were opposed to, to, to the spraying. We had a third that were in favor of it. And we had a third that, that just weren't really sure. But once they got all the education uh, material that, that they uh, typically would move to, yeah, let's go ahead and spray because that's, that's the, the, the safest and the rightest thing to do. Um, and we'll talk a little bit more about that on, on a later slide here. So what's our response plan for 2013? Well, um, we work very closely with uh, the different counties um, because most of the city is, is in Tarrant County. That's the one we work with uh, primarily. 
Um, we share uh, public education with them. Uh, they help us uh, by doing disease reporting and the epidemiology. They run the lab for, for testing the mosquitoes. And then they're helping us out this year by providing additional uh, mosquito traps. In fact, uh, this year we'll be locating mosquito traps at, at every one of the city's fire stations, which are dispersed uh, around the different zip codes throughout the city. And then the city, um, along with public education, will actually conduct the surveillance and we'll take the samples to, to the county, to their lab for testing. Uh, we'll help with larva siting um, and uh, draining source pools when, when private property owners uh, cannot be located or unable to, to, to address the issue. And then adult deciding, which is, which is the ground spraying, uh, is something the city will do once again uh, on a targeted basis based on a high incidence of uh, adult mosquitoes carrying the virus along with uh, humans contracting the, the, the virus. Um, we'll once again have a phased response. Um, you know, we're moving uh, from the off season now to the start of the season. So, you know, we have started up our um, surveillance program uh, and our outreach and our education. Uh, we're starting to do some larva siding. Uh, larva siding is, is essentially, if I didn't cover this earlier, is where you can uh, either drain the water, but if the water is, the source is, is too big to drain, um, there are these um, what you know, commonly referred to as donuts. Um, uh, the, one of the brand names is BTI, and, and it's really a, a bacteria that um, will kill off the mosquito uh, larvae. Uh, and the eggs, uh, which is kind of cool because it's, it's a naturally occurring uh, bacteria. It's not harmful to, to humans or, or pets. Uh, pets can still drink from the water, um, bathe in the water, uh, and uh, in many cases you can get these little donuts with a, uh, their time release as long as you don't break them up, uh, and they can last for as much as, as 30 days. Um, and then once again, we'll, we'll continue to, as we move forward, to look at um, the data that comes in to decide whether or not we should ground spray um, and if we get to epidemic proportions like we did last summer uh, we would once again uh, consider although we did not implement um, aerial spraying and, and and that consideration typically comes from uh, the Tarrant County Public Health Department uh, it would be upon their recommendation and then consideration by the city on whether we participate or not this shows um, on the surveillance side uh, where our traps will be. You can see that they're, they're very evenly distributed throughout the city. Um, and we'll be paying particular attention to those areas where we had positive mosquitoes last year. Uh, and then spraying, I wanted to, to, to touch base on it uh, here uh, quickly because that, that tends to be the, the thing that we get the most questions about. Um, really, there, there's two types of, of spraying. There's nuisance spraying and there's disease spraying. And nuisance spraying are, are what some communities do um, where there is um, a lot of either waterborne mosquitoes or um, where there's a lot of wetlands where you can't control mosquitoes through the typical drain the buckets and, and uh, make sure that the small puddles of water are drained. Um, so what they would typically do is, is in these areas is would have either a ground or aerial spraying that would go throughout um, uh, the summer months. Uh, you see this in, in, in Dallas and in other cities where uh, early, from early summer to, to, to late summer, uh, they're driving the fog trucks up and down uh, city streets, whether or not um, the West Nile virus is, is present or not. And then you have disease spraying, and dis disease spraying is, is where you target uh, specific and defined areas just trying to kill those mosquitoes uh, that are infected with the West Nile virus. Uh, the city of Fort Worth does not do nuisance spraying. Um, we do do disease spraying, um, and, and we do that in a very specific and targeted area, and it was very effective uh, this last year. In fact, Fort Worth was, was one of the cities that uh, was used as an example of, of how to effectively deploy uh, ground spraying uh, in those communities that have not adopted uh, a more broad or widespread uh, nuisance spraying program or that have not opted into some type of aerial spraying. 
And then aerial spraying is is when West Nile virus reaches epidemic status. That's when you you really have to look at um, okay, what are our options, um, and and which option should we we implement now, tomorrow, a week from tomorrow, um, et cetera. In our case, if you recall um, the map that I showed you earlier about um, where our, our cases were, we really had most of our cases in a very small and um, defined area. They weren't dispersed throughout the entire city, and it wasn't a big area like uh, Dallas had. And so spraying was, as an option, was was somewhat uh, overkill to um, the, the problem that we were seeing here locally. Um, that is, we would have we would have sprayed the entire city just trying to to get at the mosquitoes in an area that was less than one third of the city, and so that's why we elected to go with the ground spraying. I I know for myself, I consider the over the counter products to be fairly safe. Um, you know, the off and deep woods, and um, but I am like I think most of you that do you ever really feel comfortable spraying a a chemical on yourself uh, or um, do you really feel comfortable uh, with a, a truck driving up and down the street, uh, putting a fog uh, up in the air to uh, kill mosquitoes at night uh, in, in a community spraying program? So we, we try to balance the, the, the risks um, on both sides, you know, the chemical risk and the, the virus risk. And I hope you found this information, the summary information, um, helpful. I can tell you that um, the city's website, uh, www.fortworthtexas.gov forward slash West Nile virus. Uh, we have lots of helpful links there to how to control mosquitoes in your backyard, uh, repellents that, that, that uh, you can use, both natural and chemical, uh, what, our, what our game plan is, whether we're going to be spraying in your neighborhood. Um, you can request, you know, uh, a public uh, meeting with us through your neighborhood association or, or business group or just get all your neighbors together and we'll come out and, and talk with you. Uh, we maintain a helpful phone number there where people can uh, call and, and get more information. So I would encourage you to, um, to, to work with the city, to work with your neighbors so that uh, we can make this uh, a safe and, and enjoyable summer and hopefully get those West Nile virus numbers uh, back down to where uh, we're not seeing any victims this summer or at least uh, a small number of victims uh, that are only facing the, the very mild form of the virus and, and, and not the one um, that, that can leave people in a um, state of uh, long-term uh, rehabilitation or uh, disability. Once again, I'm Brandon Bennett, and I'm your Code Compliance Director, uh, and thank you for listening.